Thanks for coming out here. Um, I want to present to you guys today what I did during the last uh, seven months around. I'm, as you probably know, I'm, visited, I'm a visitor here and I did my master thesis here uh, under Elena and with Arnab from uh, Bristol, he's from Bristol. And I'm going to talk about uh, interpolation cryptanalysis of unbalanced physical networks with low degree round functions today. It's a long title. <laughs> and we're going to explore it gradually in the next few minutes. So here's the outline of this talk. First, I'm going to give a little bit of uh, motivation, then uh, some background about interpolating block ciphers and unbalanced Python networks. Then we're going to dive into the specific analysis that we did, um, apply that to um, sponge constructions, and then uh, a short conclusion. Right, so let's get started. Um, the, the motivation here is um, consider NPC, FHG, and some sort, some forms of zero knowledge proofs, um, specifically if they use an arithmetic intermediate representation, this error up there. They all share um, the fact that additions or like linear operations come for free, and nonlinear uh, operations like multiplications, they're expensive for different metrics, but uh, this is basically true. And if you want to use a block cipher or a traditional hash function, in one of these settings, they usually throw around multiplications like it's nothing because that's what makes them secure to a large degree, right? And um, this is also what makes them expensive in these settings. So in recent years, what has emerged is so-called, um, right, uh, this is not an accident that uh, these all share the same similarities because it's that computation corresponds to algebraic operations, right? And because of that, um, Arithmetization-oriented ciphers have emerged in the last, uh, I think, like around five years or something. So it's a rather new thing. And what they try to do is optimize for these metrics. Like they try to minimize the amount of multiplications and still, of course, they need to be secure. Otherwise, it's worthless. <coughs> and um, because they're so new, we don't fully understand them yet, or at least not to the degree where the community is comfortable using them, right? So we need to cryptanalyze them. And this is part of this effort. And just to give you a quick overview, um, in the last, I think it's four or five years, something like that, there's basically four big schemes that have emerged on how to do arithmetization-oriented ciphers. Um, there's MIMC, which is minimal multiplicative complexity. There's its generalized version, GMIMC. There's the marvelous cipher suit, which is designed by, uh, amongst others, people in here at COSIG, like Tomer and uh, Simon have uh, invented that. And there's the Hades suit. And today we're only going to focus on GMMC. And actually, not specifically GMMC, but you can keep GMMC in the back of your head. Like we're going to take a slightly more general approach here. And that, um, right, so let's talk about what it means that, uh, to interpolate a block cipher. Um, this is just any generic block cipher, non-specified what it is. There's this, uh, this cap app, there is a key that we don't know. And for some reason, that's, it has three inputs and three outputs, right? And what we can, we can see this thing, the inputs, there's some sort of variable. Oh yeah, we're uh, talking about uh, finite fields here. The cipher works on a fi finite field and actually on a prime field. So each of these inputs is the prime field element. And we can see these as variables, and then the outputs, we can see them as a polynomial in these variables, right? We don't know what it is, but it, there exists a polynomial that exhibits the exact same behavior as the cipher, or in this case, three polynomials. So this is a multivariate polynomial. Let's get rid of that. We're just going to fix almost all of the inputs, and one of the input is going to be a variable still, and that makes the output polynomials univariate that's easier to deal with. And it's enough in our analysis. And what we can now do is we interpolate between the inputs and the outputs, or say just one of the outputs, right? And then we can start reconstructing the polynomial that corresponds to this cipher. And then if we successfully manage that, we can impersonate kind of the cipher. We can uh, have a polynomial that behaves exactly like the cipher without even having the key. And 
the, the way to defend against this from a cipher designer's perspective is make this polynomial so expensive to reconstruct that it's just not practical, right? And that means have it, let it have a high degree. And in a um, prime field, that means make it the highest degree possible, which is P, min, P minus one. And in uh, this analysis here in this talk, we're not going to use um, Lagrange interpolation right away, which is as, uh, the most efficient form of interpolation, polynomial interpolation that we know. But we're going to use something called low memory interpolation. And I'm not going to go into all the details of how this works, but a rough summary here is that we don't use um, uh, known plain text or ciphertext but which would be a huge ass list that we um, need to keep in memory, right? So this is prohibited, prohibitively expensive if you want to use low memory, but um, we're going to choose our plain text ourselves and then on the fly as an online um, thing, we're going to evaluate our cipher to reconstruct a polynomial. And the basic idea is then to have the Lagrange algorithm as move it around a bit, and most importantly, we don't reconstruct the entire polynomial, but only one coefficient. And this coefficient, in our case, is going to be the coefficient of the second highest term. I am probably, so CD minus one. And I will probably refer to this as the second highest coefficient, just because it's shorter. And then the other piece of background information that you should have is what is an unbalanced Faisal network. And this is one round of an unbalanced Faisal network. In this case, it has four branches. It can be anything. So let's just put three dots and it's generalized. Um, and what we have here is we take the leftmost branch, shoot it through some function f, and apply that result additively to all the other branches. Right? That's the extending round function. And usually there's going to be some round key added, some round constant added. It's an iterative block cipher, so that's just a standard approach. And because we will be needing the output of the round function quite a lot, uh, give it a name, sigma i. All right, that's uh, all for the background. Let's dive in to um, the specific analysis. So. I'm just going to um, just going to explore a few rounds of one specific of a three branch unbalanced Faisal network here, and we're going to use the inputs. As I said before, we want to limit it to the univariate case, so we're going to use this sort of input. B is a constant that we just pick ourselves, and the rightmost branch is going to be our variable. And now let's see what happens when we start developing this. The sig the first sigma that we get, sigma zero. Um, is Gonna, it's going to be the output of f, right, on the inputs b and the key that we don't know. So we don't know exactly what sigma 0 is, but we know that there's n only constants in there. So the degree of sigma 0 is 0, in fact. And then the output polynomials after one round look something like this. And this will be then be used in the second round as uh, its input. And again, the input for the second round function is just constants. So sigma one also is uh, of constant degree, uh, has degree zero, I mean. And, um, and the output polynomials after two rounds, they look something like this. And this is the reason, now the leftmost branch has the variable, holds the variable, right? This is the reason why we shoved it in the beginning to the rightmost branch. And now when we look at what the sigma looks like, um, of course, it's going to be of degree non-zero. In fact, it's going to be of degree d. And then this is where interpolation starts to become expensive, right? And then the output looks something like this. Now there's the higher degree sigma 2 in the leftmost branch. This gets shoved into the function. And then the degree just keeps on rising, starting from, from, the second, from the third round, I mean, right? And this is going to be the output of, uh, after the fourth round. So in essence, by picking these specific inputs where we put the variable to the rightmost branch, we can kind of skip two rounds in terms of like we can lower the degree 
but for the first two rounds, we keep it zero. T minus one, to be, more, uh, to be more precise. And another neat thing about the expanding round function, which is the only type of unbalanced FISA network we will talk about today, is that because there's linear operations, like the, uh, this output of the round function is just being added to all the other output branches, we can use that. Um, so we see that there's a sigma three in uh, two of the branches. So when we just start subtracting those, suddenly the sigma three is gone, right? And that actually lowers the degree again of the result. It's not an output branch, it's some weird mix, right? But it's lowered. And then we can throw the third branch in the mix too, and we get rid of even one more sigma. And the idea here is that using this, we can knock off another t rounds from our cipher and thus lower the degree again. But it's again, t minus one rounds to be more precise, but yeah, right. So, and now how do we use this actually? And uh, the goal here is to get some sort of key recovery and in order to go there, let's explore a bit what the sigma actually looks like. And we're using a monic round function here. So this f has, as its highest coefficient, has one. And when we write this out, we get x to some power plus a polynomial in the key times x to the power minus one plus some garbage that we're not interested in right now. And then if we look at this polynomial, what is this Q, this colorful Q up there? And I'm not gonna bore you with the details. Um, then we get something, right? We know what it is. It doesn't matter right now what specifically it is, but we, we just know what it is, of course. And now this all comes together. Now we use this symbolic uh, thing, this uh, polynomial of the second highest coefficient, and we use we apply the low memory interpolation thing to a cipher of which we do not know the key. And on the one hand side, we have a polynomial in, in K, in, in the, what is supposed to be the key. And on the other hand, we have a value that kind of encodes in a certain way um, this key that we want to get. And of course, they're supposed to be the same thing. We have one equation in one unknown. Um, so we can solve it, right? And there's two approaches to solving this. The first approach is that we use a root finding method. And the second approach is that we try and apply a, the GCD, the greatest common divisor to that. And I'm gonna go into that right now. So the first thing to observe is, well, I just set up this equation, right? So we just rearrange it and this is a polynomial equation. So if we start looking for the roots of this, that actually means that we get a list of key candidates. And we know that the actual key is amongst them. And in order to test which of our candidates is the actual key, we just get one more pair of clear text and ciphertext, try it out, and then we know. The second approach is that we use the greatest common divisor. And for that, we actually use the same equation twice. And of course, we're not going to use the same equation because that doesn't contain any additional information. But in the beginning, we pick this round constant, B, for almost all our branches. We just pick another one, do the same thing again, and get a second equation. And then we arrange it a bit. And by the factor theorem, we know that the, the real key is a root of both these equations. And by the factor theorem, that means that K minus the real key kappa is a linear factor of this equation. And with a very high probability, this linear factor is actually the greatest common factor of these two equations. And thus by throwing, by co uh, computing the polynomial GCD, we can recover the key. So now the natural question that arises is, what are the trade-offs here? And uh, let's look into that real quick. In terms of runtime, the, finding the roots is more expensive and in terms of space that we need, it is also more expensive. Oh yeah, I got rid of all the log factors in the um, big O notation here, right? So it's soft O notation. And in terms of data complexity, because for the GCD approach, we need the same equation or two of those equations, um, the root finding method is cheaper by a factor of about two. 
And we ran some small scale experiments with this, um, with these parameters here. We just picked a prime that is sufficiently small for us to actually work with. And um, our round function had degree three. We had 17 rounds. With these parameters, actually 23 rounds should max out the polynomial, but my machine couldn't handle that. And um, so what resulted was a polynomial of uh, degree three to the 11. And it turns out, so this is the run times for each of the steps that needed to be done. The actual numbers don't really matter. It's just for a comparison amongst the uh, steps. And as you can see, the interpolation part dominates by a large margin um, the computational time needed. And that's even though theoretically the root finding approach is slower for at least for this size of experiment. Uh, and I guess if the parameters go up a bit, this is still true because we need to interpolate twice in the GCD approach, it's just a lot more expensive. And what's also interesting is that in the root finding method, we get a key list, right? We get a list of key candidates. And in an algebraically closed field for a polynomial of degree three to the 11, this list is also gonna be three to the 11. But we're working about uh, over finite fields, over prime fields to be more specific here. So not every possible root is in the, in the field, of course. And it turns out that the list is actually super short. It's usually below two keys. So we just need to test two key candidates and that's it. And yeah, again, this is of course for toy, it's a toy example, right? But I'm guessing that this should hold true also for bigger parameters. And then the last neat thing that we can do with this kind of analysis is when we look at it, when it's being applied in the sponge construction. So the sponge construction is a way to turn a block cipher into a hash function. And um, the diagram here on the left gives an idea of how that works. We take, we initialize a state with a bunch of zeros. And uh, this is the sponge construction over finite fields, right? Usually it works over bits, but we don't have bits here. We have uh, elements of the finite field. And then we have a bunch of branches and we just say one branch, that's our capacity and all the other branch, uh, branches, that's our uh, rate. Uh, no, the other way around. One branch is uh, rate and the other branch is our capacity. And then we just use the general sponge construction. And so for a given message M0, M1, out comes one field element. And we're only looking at one squeezing phase here. Only one, we want to have the, we want to be the hash to be only one field element, right? And out comes Z. And because in the sponge construction, all the parameters are publicly known, we know the key of this block cipher. It's usually just set to zero. What we can then do is draw at random a second message block and symbolically evaluate for uh, the second message block, the block cipher here. And we get out a polynomial here, px, right? We can also do interpolation, but that's usually more expensive, I think. And now we have the exact same situation as before in that we want this polynomial and this specific value z to be equal, right? And then we can just apply it again, this root finding method, and we get a list of uh, things and all these things, uh, all these values, they are collisions basically for our hash function. And we also did some small scale experiments with that. The parameters are basically the same, except that the number of rounds is higher because uh, symbolic evaluation turned out to be a lot cheaper. And um, so let's take a short look at this graph over here and how to read it. Um, on the x-axis, we have the number of rounds. We tried for a different uh, number, uh, amount of rounds. So for 24 rounds, we found that in 368 out of our 1,000 experiments, we found exactly one collision, one root, which is exactly one collision, right? So when we look at the entire thing, that means that all the red bars, that's where we did not find any collision. Um, yeah, that where we did not find any root, which means we did not find any collision. And all the other things uh, means that uh, we successfully found a collision of our um, in our uh, hash function here, right? 
So and that's roughly a 36% failure rate for this well, fail in the sense that we didn't find a collision for these settings. Right, to conclude, um, we found a way to kind of knock off two T, uh, two T rounds for a unbalanced Feistel network in the expanding rounds function setting, um, which leads us to the conclusion, leads us to the conclusion that if you want to use that for a block cipher, you should use at least log P to the base D plus two T rounds. And um, for the hash functions, as far as I know, this is uh, the, the branch subtraction thingy is not applicable. So it should be okay to just add t uh, rounds. Well, at least, right? Probably you want more. And um, gmimc and gmimc hash, which were the initial motivator for this, um, they both turn out to be secure against these kinds of attack. Right. And that was it for me. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.